morning. Since we are at the end of our Thanksgiving weekend, uh, and all you are pretty full from Thanksgiving dinner, this is the season when thoughts turn to the poor. It seems during Christmas everybody wants to help the poor. But what I don't understand is that the poor are here year round. Why do we only think of the poor when Christmas comes? We should think about the poor and less fortunate 365 days a year. Now, before you say, I know what you're going to say, Pastor, they're foreclosing on the house, we can't find a job, our finances are tight, we know all that. Though we often forget poverty and oppression, it is clear from the Bible that there are always on God's mind. If you look in Deuteronomy 26, 5-9, it says, The Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs of, and wonders. And he has brought us to this land flowing with milk and honey. In Luke 4, 16 through 21, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as, as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover, and recover of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Today his scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In Psalms 140, in 12, in verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. In Isaiah 25, 4, For you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress. In Psalms 10, 14, The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan, O Lord. You have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed. In Isaiah 41.17, The afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there is none, and their tongue is par parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. In Luke 6.20-21, 20, blessed, blessed are you who are poor, for yours, is the, for yours is in the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. James 2, James 2, verse 5. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But do we do these things? Not always. How many times have you passed a homeless person who is asking for a dollar or two and you say no? Why? Because you think they're going to spend it on alcohol? Has society given up on these people? Sure they have. Has God given up on them? No. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? In, Ch in Genesis chapter 18, God told Abraham, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. At this point, he does not give details of their sin, but only that because of their wickedness, people were crying out to him. It is not until Ezekiel chapter 16 that we find out what Sodom did that was worthy of death. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. Ezekiel 16.49 God destroyed Sodom on behalf of the oppressed. Sodom's prosperity had caused them to grow pridefully and neglect the poor and the needy. We might have expected God to judge them so harshly had they committed more heinous crimes, but the truth is, all of us are worthy of the same judgment. Ezekiel 18.20 bluntly declares, The soul who sins shall die. Romans 3.23 brings it closer to home. All who have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again, none is righteous, not one. 
No, not one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one, got, no one does good. Not even one. Romans three ten through twelve. But there is a solution. Though we fall under condemnation, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinctive distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by, the, by His grace as a gift. Though the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a provision by His blood to be received by faith. Romans 13, 21-25 the righteous that God requires has been made available to us apart from the law, even though the law bears witness to it. The way to be righteous before God is to simply believe in Jesus Christ, just as, just as all have sinned, all may receive righteousness as a gift because God made Jesus to be the prohibition by His blood. What this means is for our sake God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become a righteous righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The sacrifice of Jesus Christ satisfies God's righteous anger against our sin. If we believe Him, we will escape the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, just as Lot did. You remember the story of Elijah and the widow, if we all could turn to 1 Kings 17.9-14. And if you have your Bibles at home, you can turn to 1 Kings 17, 9 through 14. And it says, Arise, get thee to Zapatua, which belongeth to Zion, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zapareth. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks, and he called to her, and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she was going to fetch it. He called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruse. <coughs> and behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sent the rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of the oil fail according to the word of the Lord. Now the point of the story is, even though the widow had very little to feed her and her son, she gave what she had left to to Elijah. And God sustained the widow by filling up her flour barrel and her oil barrel. When you give to the poor, even though you can barely afford to feed yourself, God will sustain you in abundance. A little story for you. My wife went to the store last week to do our monthly shopping. and We are living on a very tight budget. And being the wife of a pastor, she does her part to help the poor. They were collecting food for the food pantry, so she brought a can, bought a can of food to give to the pantry. It doesn't take much. If you don't want to give to the homeless guy on the street, give to a charity. Give to the food pantry. Give the toys for tots. Is there a reward for giving? When we give, do we always get more in return? The biblical answer is, church? Yes. Yes. Matthew 16:27 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he sh shall reward every man according to his works. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus commands us to store up our, for ourselves treasures in heaven, saying, 
that were that they were our treasure is they were they w- there will our heart be also in mark 10:21 Jesus tells the rich young ruler go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me so we have seen that givers are enriched by God with contentment, security, and love. Indeed, God gives us all that we need to show what He is like. And we do that when we display His glory by truly giving of ourselves and of our resources. Then we fulfill the purpose of our creation. We display God's glory. How then do we live this out? First, by rejecting our culture's prominent myths about money. Money does not lead to happiness. In a Mel Gibson interview with Barbara Waters, Barbara Walters, he said, let's face it, I have been in the pinnacle of what secular utopia has to offer. I got money, fame, this, that, and the other. And when I was younger, I got my proboscis out and I dipped it into the font and sucked it up. It didn't matter. There wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. It's not good enough. It leaves you empty. The more you eat, the emptier you get. If you need more evidence than the Bible, if you won't listen to me, then listen to this very rich man. Money and its recruitments do not lead to happiness. Money does not lead to security. Even in this life, money frequently does not lead to security, but most importantly, money never leads to security in the life to come. You do not deserve what you own. All that you have is a gift from God. Even what you earned, for God gave you the ability to earn wealth. Thus, all that you have belongs to God. He has given it to you for a purpose, to use it to bring glory to His name. But you know what? When you actually do use it to bring glory, when do you actually use it to bring glory to His name? You get true happiness. You get true security. You get true love. You get true joy. You get a sense of purpose, a sense of fulfillment. You get all all the benefits that money itself can never buy. You get, out, you get out this in the present life and then a million times more in the life to come. In closing today, so will you give? I know many of you are fearful. You don't know where to begin. You may have made financial decisions in the past and now have debt hanging over you. You may have large house payments or car payments or school loans that leave you with what looks like only barely enough to make ends meet. But listen to Randy Alcorn again. When people tell him that that it is impossible for them to tip, he asks, if your income went down by 10%, would you die? Friends, you can give. You can give substantially. Will you? How important is giving to you? Is it important enough to give up your cable service, to give up your daily newspaper, to cut down seriously on earning and on eating in restaurants? To drive a car up 100,000 miles instead of one with 40,000 miles? <coughs> Do you really <coughs> believe that Christ is, is the inexpressible gift? That if you have Jesus, you have riches beyond measure? Do you really believe that God will supply all you need to fulfill His purpose in the world? Do you really believe that your greatest joy is found in knowing God, in walking obedience to Him? Do you really believe that by giving you receive much more than you give, that you fulfill the purpose of your creation? Maybe you do believe these things, but your faith is the size of a mustard seed, and that tiny bit of faith is accompanied by seemingly huge fears and doubts. If that's the case for you, know that Jesus said wonderful things about faith the size of a mustard seed. So step out in faith and pray, Lord, I believe, help me unbelieve. Maybe you don't believe that Jesus is your treasure. You don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed. Deep in your heart, you really desire money, marriage, and career success more than you desire God. My friends, acknowledge that before God, confess it before